Welcome back everyone to theCUBE's live coverage of UiPath Forward 6. I'm your host, Rebecca Knight, along with my co-host and analyst, Dave Vellante. We are joined by Kelly DeCordy. She is the Chief Customer Officer here at UiPath. Thanks so much for coming on theCUBE, Kelly. Thank you for having me. So uh, before, before we get started, I want to ask about your role because you are a, you're a tech veteran. You were at HPE for many years, um, Google. You've just joined UiPath in May of this year. How are you finding it? <laughs> How are things going for you so far? I'm absolutely loving it, actually. So, um, yeah, I've been here since six months, as you say. I'm leading everything to do with customer operations, the partner organization, a lot of our services to support, professional services, industries, enablement, incentive comp, and many other things in between. So really just everything that makes the go-to-market tick. And um, it's been an awesome ride so far. It's great to be here over the last two days and for the rest of this week with our customers and partners. Do you want to walk us through a little bit about how you work with customers and how you're helping them make this, uh, this move to automation and AI, especially as AI is, is moving at this breakneck speed? Yeah, so we've got a lot of customers, as you probably know already. I think uh, the last count, it was about 10,800. And, um, and people are using automation to different extents, but I think even the ones that have been customers for a long time are finding new ways of doing things. So, Something I think is important for us to actually share the learnings amongst our customer base. So we're doing a lot of customer advisory boards, making sure we're getting out into the markets, making sure people can hear from other customers because that generates ideas as well. We're working on industry use cases to make sure that people can envisage for their industry sort of what are the top five to 10 use cases that automation and AI can be applied to and how they can learn from that as well. So those are just a couple of the examples. And one other thing maybe just to bring to light is the solution accelerators as well. So um, we've got 60 so far that are published on our marketplace and they really help customers get started. And some of our customers have said that by using them they've sort of um, shortened the implementation time from maybe weeks down to just a couple of days. So that's been great as well. So you knew Rob at, when you were at Google? I did, I worked for him at Google Cloud. <laughs> Okay, so we love Google, right? <laughs> I mean, awesome, we were just at Google Next this summer. I wouldn't say it's a sales culture though. It's really an engineering driven culture. It's really product first, product takes care of itself. And it's been interesting to see Rob come over and the impact that, that he's had with the North Star and you know, that whole thing, and, and so it's working. How do you think about industry uh, go to market, specifically in the context of AI and what seems to be the need to have domain specific or industry specific capabilities. What's the conversations like six months in with, with customers and how do you think about that going forward? Yeah, I definitely think that the industry um, specific use cases, like I mentioned, are super important. And we decided that we were going to focus on a few to start off with, get those in a really good shape. So financial services, healthcare and life sciences, we focused on manufacturing and telecommunications. And in North America, we've been focusing on the public sector as well. We've started to build out others now, like oil and gas, and there's actually a, a former colleague from HP who just joined us in the oil and gas space, uh, who I saw today, super exciting. But we're starting to build out in other areas as well, but we've work, been working very heavily on our marketing materials, our use cases, our case studies, um, so that people can like repeat and see what other customers are doing and learn from that as well. And how do you think about balancing sort of the, the direct selling versus the partner selling, the ecosystems? What's your kind of general philosophy? How do you see that evolving? Good question. And in fact, I spent all day yesterday with the partners mm -hmm. And um, you know, we really want to have a very partner first mindset. So we're a software company at the end of the day, and whilst we do professional services, we'd really like our partners to be doing the majority of the implementations. So we're going to be focused very much with our services on first of a kind, new growth products, um, building out as well some level of partner assurance to help the partners be successful as well. And um, from our partner ecosystem, I've literally just been meeting with some just now, just really focusing on, they're excited, they believe that there's a lot of potential with us, and we want them to be able to make money with us as well, you know, and, uh, and have great thriving businesses for the future. You've talked a lot about this, this drive for use cases and showing how it's actually bringing value to the enterprise. What are the messages that you find are resonating most with customers and what, what are your findings and how repeatable are they from organization to organization? 
They're quite repeatable, actually. So I think um, you know, if a customer is doing claims processing or mortgage processing, then whilst the process itself may not look identical, there's a lot of similarity in terms of sort of the steps that someone will go through. So that's something we can help to accelerate, I would say. Um, and, and for sure, for those that are willing to share their stories, and many are, I think customers can learn a lot from what other customers have done. Um, and maybe even our own financial services um, sort of transformation internally. So our organization has actually been transforming themselves. We saved about $50 million um, in annual savings that we've actually taken out cost out of our own finance auto, um, organization by automating processes. So even just being able to share those types of use cases with others has been phenomenal. So there's a lot of talk about moving from the, you know, extending from the back office to the front office. I think Jarvis is, is the sales assistant, is that right? Or, yes. Yeah, okay. Are you, are you doing it, this is the dog fooding question. <laughs> are you doing it internally, how's that working? What kind, of, what kind of response are you getting from customers in the field? Yeah, we've had a number of customers who've been sort of on beta trials for some of these products. I was with British Airways in New York just a couple of weeks ago, my very own uh, favorite airline. Uh, and um, they've been using it pretty extensively for all types of use cases. I need to use it within my own support organization to provide better services and faster services to customers as well. So we're both using them internally, but also having some customers sort of trial things out as well. So lots of good progress so far, but it's going to be interesting now to take things more formally to market. As a sales executive, there's also a lot of talk about how AI is going to change the whole go to market. I was at a, a, an LP meeting a couple months ago. It's like BDRs are dead. I, I don't think that's true but I'd be interested in your take. I mean, certainly it's changing marketing, making marketing people more productive. I can get ideas, and write copy, et cetera. How is it changing the sales function? Actually, interesting about BDR, so we've been launching some new sales plays uh, for the second half here now, and um, really been using some AI technologies to help us kind of generate some of the content in a more, quick manner and also training our own models so we can build out content in the future much quicker when we know which standard assets we need, when we need them, how we're going to give that to BDRs to kind of help them. I think people still like to speak to a person, uh, at least I do, um, but a number of our customers do. But being able to move more quickly with those assets, being able to refresh things quicker as well, I think that's a great AI use case. It's the number one question I always ask when you do chat online, are you a bot? Yeah. <laughs> but their voices are getting so much better. I, I mean, you, you, Siri and Alexa are going to sound so lame in you know, a couple years from now because they laugh, they have expressions, it's really true. Um, so how, one of the biggest questions with AI is there's so much resistance or skepticism from the workforce itself yeah. because people are nervous and people uh, fear the unknown, that's, that's human. How do you work, how, you, you mentioned how you're using it in your own organization. Mm -hmm. How are people, how are, how are the rank and file experiencing AI in terms of how it's helping them do their jobs better? I can give you a very practical example, one that I've really enjoyed since I've started. So I've got my own personal bot uh, who kind of reminds me to do certain things. Um, and we're using it in the HR um, sort of supply chain of information. So both for onboarding to help you get onboarded quicker. So you know when you start a new organization and you maybe want to ask questions but you don't want to be silly or ask things that maybe you should have read somewhere and you can go in and just type and, and chat effectively. The bot will respond to you with you know, where you should go, which information you could look at and so on. But it also reminds me of things like people's work anniversaries which I think is super personable. So you know, so, so and so and so and so has been here for like five years. Why don't you tell them congratulations and maybe follow up with them with a quick Slack and then the Slack's then integrated so you just have to click on it and you're able to respond really quickly. So you look very super engaged. You can do it in just a, a couple of clicks and just those small things that I think um, are really powerful for individuals. Oh, that's, that's key, right? That is like superpower. You, you <laughs> In the early days of sales training when I was younger, we, we, you know, remember the book Swim with the Sharks? I don't know if you guys ever, and it was all about, okay, write down their kids' names and yes. their birthdays, yeah. and, and you know, it took a lot of work. 
right, back. right. <laughs> you had to roll a Dex. Of course, but those are the tricks because now, it makes people feel that you care about them. Now you can not only automate that in terms of the reminders, but you can actually have the, the AI take action Correct. for you. Mm -hmm. If you're not doing that, you're, you're going to be falling behind. Right? Exactly. I mean, you got to really be leaning into that as a sales organization. Exactly. Uh, and that, that's just one process. Now take that uh, automation in your entire company. I think it's just, it, people talk about, is this overhyped? Is it underhyped? I don't know, but I do know this, that the next generation of leaders, your customers, I'm not even talking about technology companies, mm -hmm. but them as well, it's the ones who apply automation are, are going to win. Just like ERP, back in the day, right. you know, right. if you could have figured out who was going to be the best at implementing SAP, you, those companies did better. They made more money, their stocks went up. Yeah. I think the same thing's going to happen And here. I loved it when Rob talked this morning about sort of the four day week, you know, getting a little bit of time back. <laughs> Everyone can get behind uh, that. Like, oh yeah, I like the idea of that. That would be awesome. And I think that's important. We're not about co cost savings necessarily only. It's really about allowing people to do more interesting work, allowing people to you know, go into domains or areas where they may not have had the time to do so before because they were doing such repetitive tasks. So um, I think really up-leveling the workforce as well. See, I think it could almost double your productivity. So I, in my mind, I'm thinking the eight-day work week. You know, <laughs> oh my God, Dave, in, enough. In 50 hours, <laughs> I mean, it's, it, come on. <laughs> How fun would that be? He's not that fun. <laughs> um, but I want to ask you about the, the, the idea of innovation and yeah. how you stay ahead of the curve on all of these things because the, the pace of change is, is so dizzyingly fast. How are you maintaining creativity, innovation, um, ingenuity within your organization? Well, uh, we have the best head of innovation out there, of course, Mr. Daniel Dines. I know you're going to have him on the show uh, soon here. So I think it's great now with Rob taking over the sole CEO uh, position from February. Daniel's going to be able to focus exclusively his time on innovation. And let me tell you, he's busy at it already, uh, keeping everyone on their toes in terms of you know what's next um, and having a really long-term vision, not just a short-term vision as well. We also work with a lot of partners um, in the ecosystem, so we're connected with all of the hyperscalers, um, as I mentioned yesterday. So not only AWS, Microsoft, and Google, but you saw this morning as well, Anthropic um, from the LLM perspective and others. So we're just keeping connected with as many uh, organizations as we can, so we can sort of become the connective tissue, I guess, um, and bring all of these things to our customers uh, in a shorter manner and not have them having to sort of bring all these things together. Yeah, bring that optionality. I mean, Anthropics, they're everywhere. I mean, so, uh, they're double down. And are you getting, I asked, I think I asked Rob this question, let me ask you as well. Are you getting customers saying, hey, we get some of our data's in the cloud, some of our data's on-prem, we're thinking about data at the edge in our factory, we want to bring the AI to the, to the data. Are you, are, you, are, you, are you hearing that? There's latency concerns, there's, IP leakage, there's compliance, et cetera. Do you, do you think, first of all, you you hearing that from customers, and how real is that versus like the old days of cloud? We're never going to go into the cloud, it's not secure, and that changed. Well, yeah, how do you I think, think about um, this one? you know, I would say that for new customers, probably about 80% of them are going cloud first. But one of the things that we've offered, um, and one of the only companies to offer this, was having an on prem and a cloud solution, so we still do have a lot of customers who are actually either in both worlds or some even that are in an on-prem only world. Um, I haven't really heard latency from the customers I've spoken to be so much of an issue, but for sure, um, customers are concerned always about security, so we have to work through that with them, making sure that they fully understand where their data is going to be, how it's going to be utilized, and so on. So that's just a standard approach that we focus on. There's never any issues, but it's just one of the things that we just have to get through as part of the as part of the onboarding. Is, is security a use case for UiPath? Maybe not so much, right? Not uh, so much right uh, now. Something we may consider. because it's. I mean, the security guys are pretty AI savvy, so they're yeah. kind of doing it themselves. But things like software testing, obviously, yeah, testing is an for sure is a yeah. huge area for us and a huge area of growth as well. Mm. 
So, Kelly, this is your first forward ever. Yes. Um, what are the kinds of conversations that you're having as Chief Customer Officer with, with customers here on the floor and in, and in breakout sessions and, and on the sidelines? What are you hearing and what are you going to go back to your desk on Monday and get going on? So I've already taken a lot of actions even over the last few hours. I think people, to your point earlier, are about sort of getting together in person. It's just a great way. So we may have spoken to each other on the phone before, but we haven't actually met in person and created those connections. And I think people are inspired by, by a lot of things they see or from stories that they hear other customers telling where they want to jump on that and like, how can I move faster? How can I do better? And with which partners as well should I be doing that with? So I've been spending time too with the partners in terms of making sure that we've got an action plan by geography, by industry of which partners we're going to operate with, in which segment of the market, in which um, country around the world, and in, in, in which industry. So I sort of refer to it a little bit like uh, matchmaking, you know, so you're trying to match make customer partner and UI path to have the best possible outcome. Exciting times. Yeah, yeah, okay. indeed, indeed. Thank you so much for coming on theCUBE. This no, has been thank a really you so great much. conversation. Thank you. I'm Rebecca Knight for Dave Vellante. Stay tuned for more of theCUBE's live coverage of Forward Six here in Las Vegas. <laughs>